everyone. Um, my brother does MMA and he always comes down the aisle. I never get to. <laughs> um, all right, I have a clicker. So, uh, I don't have like super detailed notes. So if I ramble a little bit or am um, um, not fully on the ball, always sorry. Uh, right. Oh, wrong way. OK. Um, so I've been learning a lot about people lately uh, by talking about social issues on Facebook. Um, I think that. You know, if a uh, place like us, if you had a degree program in digital debates, I would probably already have a PhD. Uh, Self-directed, of course, and fast-track program. Um, but I've also learned a lot about myself in these conversations and have learned that I have a lot of really strong opinions about almost everything and that those opinions, beliefs, whatever, whatever I'm thinking about, reading about, doesn't always make it into my work on a consistent sort of everyday level. And that's an interesting disconnect because um, it means that the people that I'm speaking to, even though maybe they know me uh, as a painter or dancer or writer or whatever, they don't necessarily associate me as a creative with politics um, or civil rights or whatever. So, because um, usually I do stuff like this. I paint murals and um, I have spent a lot of time traveling around painting. And this is a piece in Atlanta for Living Walls Festival. Um, it was the bike tour. I didn't talk about politics. Uh, I figured I'd show you some of the like, older stuff. So I used to do a lot more street art. Not so much anymore. Um, and then also some smaller things for galleries. This is my mom. She's here somewhere. She's over there. Uh, you can't see the whole piece, but it's me. Oh, yeah, I got a point to it. That's me. And that's my mom. And that's my little sister. And that's in Baltimore. Uh, so I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about public art, mural art, as a way that one could not only engage with the community, but make a community better, um, help the community to make itself better. And I, I spent a lot of time talking about it as like this idea that no matter what you were doing in public visual space, if it wasn't something that was like selling something, if it wasn't something that was advertising, like that was a political statement in itself. And uh, I guess I, I, I still have, um, I still have a belief that there's room in art for, or there's room in the world for beauty to be added to it. But I also have had some experiences that make me think more that art uh, in and of itself is not enough. Um, and that's really changed how I think about my own practice. And it's really changed how I, uh, what I do when I do it. Oh. No. Oh. OK, so um, in 2011, I started, I switched from dancing to painting as a focus um, around 2008, 2009. And then after a few years of just like being a full-time artist and like I'd quit my day job, I was living in this really shitty studio at Maine and Hastings. And it's like surviving on coffee and cigarettes and um, not sleeping, just painting. Um, after a couple of years of that, I got really burned out, obviously. And I had like so many deadlines and 
exhibitions and mural projects and whatever, just trying to like make enough money to buy more paint so that I could paint another picture and I could sell it and then I could make more money and I could buy some paint. Um, and I wasn't really thinking about what I was making. It was more just like, I have a show, do something, do something. And I was making pretty things, um, beautiful things, things people liked, but I didn't feel like I was saying much of anything. Um, I didn't feel like the work that I was making was thoughtful or that I was putting a whole lot of myself and my internal self into it. Um, so I, well, I mean, it wasn't a really like clear decision, but I ended up moving to Cape Town, in South Africa, in 2011. And I took a few years, and then a couple of years since I've been back to really just focus on helping other people create uh, and, and finding ways through workshop facilitation, mentorship, um, curating exhibitions, managing mural projects, whatever it was, uh, like sort of visual arts, performing arts, and media industry, uh, trying to find ways to I don't like the term give back because I find it's used too much, but really, you know, trying to nurture creativity in other people uh, rather than just focusing on myself and give myself some time to just think and have some space to figure out what I wanted to make and why. Uh, and I'm going to show you some, a couple of video clips from a couple of projects I was involved in while I was there. I'm talking about them a bit, but because the videos are too long to show in their entirety, you can see them, I don't know, afterwards or online. Anyways, we'll figure it out. Um, right, so while I was in Atlanta, I met someone who was it Atlanta? Yeah, so I was on this panel about community engagement through the arts, and I was speaking alongside, I'm getting, I don't remember her name, but she works for an organization called the Estria Foundation, I think she actually founded it, uh, in LA, and they were doing a series of mural projects around the world called Water Rights. And these projects, they, um, they explored why water is important to different communities in different countries, and they tried to engage with that community to uh, plan and execute the project. Uh, and they had nobody, they didn't have the budget to send anybody to Africa. They wanted to do something on the continent. And since I was going back there, they asked me if I would put something together. So I worked with, uh, I think, six other muralists. We found a space at a school, Lusasazo School in Kailicha, which is the largest township in Cape Town. Um, can you guys hear me? Is this OK? Is this OK? OK, OK. Uh, and we put together a series of workshops that fed into uh, the mural planning process with the professional artists. And then we painted this like massive long, I don't know, it was like 100 meters long or something, wall at the school with the students. Um, and this was around the time where I was starting to feel like you come into a city, especially as a visiting artist, uh, and this happens a lot these days, like street art and mural festivals, they're trendy, and I'm not saying they're a bad thing, but I mean, I've, I've participated in many of them, uh, but I do feel that based on the time schedule, uh, time constraints, and, and the, the nature of the beast, like bringing in 
artists from around the world. They have a week to paint. They're painting in a community they don't necessarily know very well. And even if that, a lot of times the mural has nothing to do with the community, and that's fine sometimes. Um, and even if it does, it uh, generally tackles an issue that the community is dealing with and or tries to represent the community's views on something. And, um, and then the mural's done, and the artist leaves, and the problem is still there. Kailicha has a very large population in a very small space. There are those who are in informal settlements. They don't have water. They rely on one tap. And whenever they are in need of water, they go and take water and they don't even have drains. Not everyone has access to a tap in their home. Most people are sharing taps with others in the community and they're also sharing toilets with others in the community. So basic sanitation is a huge issue there as well as being able to have water in your home, which I think is pretty important for all of us, for our dignity as human beings. Water rights is an exploration of issues around the importance of water to a particular community, city, or country in the world. It is a series of mural projects that have been happening all over the world over the course of last year and this year. This is the ninth in the series, and it's the first one in Africa, which I think is really important because water is such a huge issue here. So part of this mural is really using that space as a way to help educate the community. We started with two days of workshops. Um, during those two days, we worked with 50 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds to explore water not only through formal learning, but also through taste, through touch, through sound, through movement, gathering all of those inspirations and responding to them in ways that are maybe pushing people outside their comfort zones a little bit and helping them find new ways of expressing themselves. <laughs> To me, it was exciting and to give the learners information about water, information that they were not aware, most of them, so that they can know how to use water, not to destroy or to, to misuse the water. I think that the kids really enjoyed themselves and they were really engaged with the process the whole way through. All of the artists felt really inspired coming out of the workshops. The structure of this project is set up in such a way that um, the workshops feed directly into the mural. We collected everything that they made, all of these sketches, all of these writings. Some of the kids wrote stories, some of them wrote poems, and we brought it back to the studio. We sat for a whole day looking over what they've made, talking about our experiences in the workshop, talking about our experiences in the community, what we felt was most effective for us to bring to this community, for us to share. And now we're preparing for the children. They're gonna come, then we're gonna uh, take the paint and the brushes. Then we're gonna group them, there are 50 children. So we all divide into four groups. Then we give them brushes. Then they're going to fill in these uh, characters. Just showing the actual water flow through the body. And because obviously we're made out of three quarters water to show like a big human like you know swimming it's like yeah it's a wall but it's like an educational wall we're actually going to be having like information and statistics and stuff like that so it's not just like a nice piece it's a nice way to show them that water is the most important thing in our life i painted a nice big section of the hydrological cycle which the children learnt about in the school where the water comes from. 
my idea yeah. as an artist for this wall is to work with their native language, Singamanzi, which means we are water. My hope for the wall is to educate the people of Kailucha and to, to give the message that we are still water and we have to sustain this water and we have to sustain the school or the wall that is painted by the artist. This colorful idea that we put on the wall it's for the community, it's created with the community, with the kids out of the community. We let their ideas be an influence on us, they painted with us. I hope that they're really enjoying this. I'm hoping that the wall goes on to speak for a couple of years to people. We're going to have a whole community walking past this wall. Each and everyone who's in the community can see that the water that you are having, you must look after it, you must sustain the water because if there's no water, they have nothing. Whenever you place a piece of public art in the community, especially when you involve the community actively in creating it, you have the opportunity to change that community for the better. And that's what we're hoping to do here. with the community, the problems that are there, and then paint a mural about it so that they could show that piece to someone in another country and that person could learn, okay, this is what, uh, this is what they're dealing with. And Cape Town really is dealing with some serious water problems. They are, I think, depends on which source you read, but they're about a month away from not having drinking water in the reservoir. Uh, and they're under some really severe water restrictions. This has sort of been building up since then. Um, but in the townships, as you heard, there's a bit of a different problem, well, a big different problem, in that access to water as a resource is, uh, can be quite dangerous if you are a woman and you are walking to a toilet in the middle of the night and uh, there's no street lights, uh, there's a lot of violent crime, there's a lot of sexual assault, um, and so something like, something that we take for granted, like getting up to pee in the middle of the night, turns into uh, something that could be life-threatening. Um, one of the problems that we identified with the teacher is also something that we take for granted because Canada has a really great education system. South Africa has a huge problem with service delivery, whether that is with um, textbooks or just sort of the materials that the schools have to make the schools run. There's a shortage of teachers that are qualified to teach or they're just overstretched. So there's one teacher teaching like, like me, like 50 kids. Um, and we realize that a lot of these children, you know, they're like 12, 13, they'd never been taught the basics about something like the water cycle. Uh, something like the, your body's makeup that involves water, mostly. Uh, and so we wanted to not only create something that was educational, we wanted to create something that could also be... Um, could also be enjoyed by other people in the community that were not children because the whole is like on a main street. The wall's super long. 
Um, we wanted it to be available, uh, engaging for more than just the kids at the school, although they were the main focus. So A, we didn't want to paint something that the community was living with already. Like, yes, they know they don't, they know they have to use taps. They know they have to use toilets. Like, they're not going to want to look at it. And they're the ones that have to live with it. Um, this has also become, I mean, slight digression. I've been in a lot of spaces where muralists have come in and painted something in a community that goes against that community's cultural context, and that's been a big issue. Uh, the first mural that I painted when I went to Cape Town was uh, this old guy's house. He was Muslim. He did not want any faces on his wall, and I do portraits. <laughs> and I was like, okay. This is the wall. This is the house I've been given. He really wants something, but he wanted like palm trees. And I was like, I can't paint. Or really, like I can't paint palm trees. I mean, I can. But I'm also going to be working on this wall for like a week. And if I'm not engaged as an artist with what I'm painting, it's going to be really hard for me to do my best work. So we compromised which I think is really important when working with community. Compromised and he got some trees, but they were kind of weird looking. <laughs> and all of the kids in the, that part of town helped me paint them. Okay, so where was I? Um, okay, so we didn't want to paint the problem, right? But we also, wanted to paint something that the community could connect to. We ended up with this idea of a bunch of different water facts, none of which were written out in English. We got local translations for everything. Um, and had the kids participate in each part of the process. Now, this is great, but at the end of the day, when we were doing a debrief, I felt, I still felt like it wasn't enough. Like, Yes, we've provided a service, but it's short term and the effect is limited. We're all going to leave and they still have, you know, issues with water. We didn't fix them. We, and we didn't want to, language is important. So it's, it's also, I find myself saying things like we didn't fix the problem when um, that perspective is in itself uh, limiting to the community that you're working with. Um, and one of the things that I really learned while I was there is that the most important thing that I could do is take the skills and the knowledge and the resources that I have and invest them into empowerment rather than um, problem solving. So I was working with a youth development organization. It was actually just after we finished this project, I had got a job. And the next week I started with them. It's called Livity Africa. Um, they are... Well, this is for later. They are a youth-created content platform and digital marketing skills agency that trains young people, uh, basically provides a, a springboard into employment for people that do not have access to information about where to find employment, opportunities once, even if they do find information, the, the resources that they have to get to and from work. Um, there's so many stumbling blocks for people who have so much 
talent and drive, but um, there's a disconnect between the time you finish school, where do you go from that? And we found that without a bridge, a lot of youth were ending up in gangs, on drugs, whatever. Um, but again, it was about not doing things for anyone, but providing a space and a, a, a venue for the young people to do the things themselves with guidance. So for me as a maker, that was also really a challenge because I like to make things. You know, like I like to get my hands dirty, I like to write, we were making a magazine, um, doing photo shoots. I was like the, had a very vague title, I was Youth Development Coordinator, which basically meant, oh, and Fashion and Style Mentor, <laughs> which basically meant that every three months I was hiring around 25 interns between the ages of 16 and 24, working with a group of professionals, uh, mentors, who are professionals working in their fields, um, to manage these young people's process as they go through the next three to six months, sometimes longer. And, um, but hands off, like, they have to come up with the ideas, they have to pitch their stories, they have to go do the interviews, they have to take the photos, um, and at the end of every three months, somehow we manage to put together a print magazine every time, uh, as well as a blog and different things on social media. Um, so for me as a maker, Having to stay hands off and let them figure it out, well, not figure it out completely for themselves, but do it for themselves and be okay with letting people fail because they need to learn from it, uh, that was challenging because I am a bit of a control freak with my own work. I like to, <laughs> there was a lot of moments where we were, we were so late and the magazine has to come out, you know, we have to go to print. And somebody's either not there or they, they haven't finished their story. And I'm like, I can do it. Like, I know how to do this. I can just do it. But that totally defeats the point. Um, anyways, where was I going with that? So, so I was working with this agency and after the three months I had to help these young people like we would make a career plan for them and help them with their resume provide a springboard for the next step whether that's going back to school or finding a job or another internship um, that was my main role and it was a lot of fun but it was also really <laughs> really exhausting and and I got burnt out after a while. While I was in that role, I, we got hired to help Red Bull uh, run. Connecting people who are doing good things. Helping people who try to help others. Pico is a place where upstart social innovators, people with a good idea, can come and really make the most of their idea. People call them change makers, pioneers, social activists, but really for us, a social entrepreneur is, is somebody who is using their creativity, their talent, their energy to really make a difference. How to develop an entrepreneurial mindset. Turning homes into art galleries, so it's called township art galleries. The main idea 
is to try to change the way in which the community looks at a mentally disabled person. We work with artisans from the townships, painters, carpenters, tilers and, and pavers, and we promote their services. Basically, it's a school bag for kids that is made out of 100% plastic shopping bags. Um, it integrates solar technology as well as retroreflective material. So it really tries to bring green innovation, making kids aware of the benefits of actually recycling. We empower waste collectors uh, in our community. So they'll go around from one rubbish bin to the next collecting recyclable waste and they take that waste to sell it to uh, recycling agencies. We need to empower them with functional and durable cards so that um, we have a system that is that allows them to collect um, or do their work um, very efficiently. Most of the students are struggling with medicine science because it's not fun, it's not engaging for them and it's not interesting. And the only reason they're facing that problem is because of the shortage of, re of, of quality medicine and science teachers in schools. The cell phone industry is growing and as it grows, a lot more students are gaining access and therefore they have the technology through their smartphones. We created an app called the Cellfonda app. And what this app does is it basically allows students to access video tutorials. We've brought together 18 amazing young entrepreneurs from around the country and we're letting them meet up with some inspiring individuals from around the world from all sorts of areas that can give them advice, mentorship, inspiration that can really take them as individuals to the next level and the projects that they're working on. It's fundamental tools that I must admit that I didn't have before. I didn't have a concept of what I'd be here. Inspiration and motivation and kind of big ideas mixed in with some very practical, tangible things that, you know, that we could take away and work with. Yeah, then Almost concluded yeah. that the child is not the answer. What's the core problem with your model? And what's the problem, what's the solution? And the and <laughs> As the world focus on Africa, as the next uh, growth uh, region, People like this with their passion, with their creativity and innovativeness are the engine that is going to drive the next phase of African uh, economic empowerment. Every day is packed. We start with a two hour lecture. Failure is a tool to help you learn. It's not a consequence of making a mistake. When you've got no evidence except a dream and hope in your heart and a head, heart and feet to make it happen, you the reason people will believe. Then a lunch break before going into the crowd group sessions. Go on, the way life's going. Today, if you will. After that, it's one-on-one -on -one sessions with the mentors or working on stuff in the studio. And then exhibitions and the nightlife after that. My name is Shalom. My day involves working with all of the participants to schedule themselves into time slots with mentors for individual or group sessions. Instagram is the world's largest photo sharing network. You need to use this platform to tell your story. You need to step back, go to the people around you who give you energy. When you go looking for funding, is a relationship. A lot of projects have been funded by crowdfunding and it's really working. If I was to choose to go the crowdfunding route, right, yeah. what am I asking for? A key part of being a, any entrepreneur, but particularly a social entrepreneur, is being able to tell your story and really to take your message to as wide an audience as possible. So we've got a fully resourced creative studio at the Academy where they will get assistance in telling their story, designing logos, putting together pitch videos. I quite like the, just the start of the question mark. The core marketing materials, the core communication materials that any entrepreneur need to tell his story. We need to have a trademark on the card. Yeah, so we've got time, time pressure. I knew we would take a lot home from the interaction, but Every day I'm, I'm just hearing more and more from this group of individuals of things that they're doing, the way they're doing, their courage, their perseverance. Just a lot of opportunities and mentorship is brilliant and we're learning so much. When I come here and I meet all these people, I say like, they are the champ of what they do, you know? And uh, everyone brings something like from their culture, their dedication, you know? And this is very like uh, inspiring. It's just really cool just to be a part of you know, what's happening here and to share this time and, and build connections with these other amazing individuals. Yeah. <laughs>
when the 10 days are over, it's not the end of the journey. And there's going to be some ongoing activity and connection points and mentoring that's going to happen for all the participants. So the hope is this will be a massive boost for them to kind of launch forward when they re-enter back into their world after this really intense experience and that they'll be sprinting in certain areas where they, you know, they might not have been before. For ourselves as creatives and also as uh, whatever, project managers, entrepreneurs. Uh, so this is just something that I thought was really a great way to explain what I've been trying to do for myself. Um, so I know I love art. I know that I'm good at some of it. Um, I do get paid for some of it. But what does the world need? The world, my world, doesn't need a, another pretty picture right now. Um, maybe sometimes I need it just as a release, but if I'm trying to really be uh, responsible with my energy and think about, think about how I can best channel that energy into making a difference because I can't live without making a difference in some way it feels wrong. Uh, so trying to connect all those dots is a constant process, obviously, and it's not something that I have fully figured out yet, but um, I think it's one of the most worthwhile things that one can do as a creative. And some of it does happen on Facebook, and that's okay. Because Facebook is an imperfect venue for dialogue, but it is where most of our conversations happen. So um, if we're not going to use it to talk about things that matter, what are we? <laughs> I can only watch so many cat videos, and I love my cats. Um, yeah. I don't have like a really fancy conclusion. <laughs> but that is the end of what I have to say. Who has some questions for Shalom or for Indigo? You can choose. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious about what it was like um, making that transition from like having control over your work to giving it away and like giving responsibility to other people and having them take it on. Um, frustrating. <laughs> um, exhausting. There's a lot of diplomacy involved in collaboration, and I tend to be the person who's connecting the dots between, because it's never just one other person. It's like, okay, we're working together as a team, and artists are all you know, really strong personalities and have strong opinions about everything. So, uh, and we all have different ways of working. Um, so there's a lot of like, providing an open space for us to talk about why we think that's a bad idea. But you think it's a good idea. Um, and so somebody has to be the neutral partner, and I just tend to be good at that. Um, yeah, also, you know, I always feel the need to balance it out with, like, because I'm, I'm kind of an introvert, uh, and also really a loner. <laughs> So I like spending time at home by myself, and that helps me recharge. Yes, sir. Um, on the social entrepreneurship and the economic impacts, do you think there's any way that might be applied to the situation in this neighborhood, i.e. the homeless people, or can you vision anything there that might work? Well, I think that there's already a lot of social enterprise working in the downtown east side. Um, United We Can is probably the biggest one, but there's many others. And I think that. Why? Because, like, insomnia. Uh. <laughs> 
Can okay. you bring the microphone with you? Uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Potter, come on, man. This is my friend Victoria. She drew the postcard. She was supposed to be here at the beginning. <laughs> anyway, sorry, to answer your question, there is already a ton of social enterprise happening. Um, some of it more impactful than others. I'm not well enough versed in the people that are working in this space to be able to say, uh, to be able to have a really definitive opinion. But I do think that anytime a community and the people that live there are involved in designing, identifying problems and designing their own solutions, it's much more likely to succeed than if somebody comes in and says, hey, we, we see you have this problem and this is how we're gonna fix it. Do you have any suggestions for, or can you give examples of how in your projects, we were, in our group we were talking about how when you finish a mural, or when you're creating a mural or doing a community, especially like community arts projects, you know, you've got your music playing and people are around and people are walking by and getting engaged, but then when the project's over and you leave and there's no more painting to be done, um, how, do you, how do you make community art projects or like community social enterprise projects continue um, even when the actual act of creating them is over? I would love to know the answer to that. <laughs> um, I think that some of the ways I've, like, I'm always trying to figure out how do we extend that, you know? And, and all of the projects that I've been a part of, the ones that I've led, have been time-based, you know? There's a start, there's the work, and there's the end. And um, it's not an ongoing, like, I don't run an organization that has... Uh, a space where people can come to. But I think that maintaining relationships could be a big answer to uh, continuing that thread. Like if you're working with a school, like I was, um, after the project's done, if they have more work in terms of like, hey, come into the class and talk to the kids about this or that or whatever, uh, that's a really good way of trying to stay connected. Um, it, depending on the community, the internet can be really helpful, but that also depends on how much access people have to connect to the internet. Uh, the Amapico project that I helped with, I, we still have a WhatsApp group, <laughs> and we tell each other what we're working on, um, me and the, the participants, and, um, you know, try and support, even if it's long distance. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one. I don't know exactly. We're getting short on time, so maybe one more from the audience up here. Hi. Um, what does equality mean to you? Can you talk about equality a bit, please? Thank you. Um, I guess I didn't really say the word equality in my talk, but I, I, I I feel that this is such a huge subject and it's really early morning. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of things to unpack there. But uh, I think focusing on access to education, access to resources, access to information, to the basics, um, that can travel across a lot of different uh, communities, whether it's um, class-based or race-based or gender-based. Um, some, there's some form of somebody has access to something that I don't have. And how to make, how to bridge that gap, I think in many ways can foster equal growth. Does that make sense? You know, as I listen to you and, and, and know your work and listen to the talk, I, I keep coming in my head back to this idea that equality isn't a place you get to. It's like an, it's a verb mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter where you're at. It's, the, it's using your creativity and energy and time and resources to make a difference. Mm 
yeah. which is what you've done. And so thank you for sharing your story with us. That's amazing. The world is a little bit more equal because you're in it. And I'm, I'm really happy that we had you here. Indigo. Indigo.